So hello everyone, I'm Linda Braun and I'm the CE consultant for YALSA and this is oh, one in our series of, um, of sessions on the competencies for uh, library, teen services competencies for library staff. This session is on engaging learning experiences and I'm gonna let Megan introduce herself. So at the moment, I'm just going to give a few housekeeping things. If you haven't found the chat already, it's down at the bottom of the screen. If you're on a desktop or laptop computer, you should see chat. You should be able to open it up and if it's, Attached to your window, you can pop it out. There's a down arrow on the left side and you should be able to click on that and then um, pop out the chat so that you can move it around the screen. Some, sometimes people um, really like that capability, me for one. Um, also, feel free to use the chat throughout the session. Megan's gonna have time for questions and answers, but just so you can, um, we like to have conversation going throughout, so feel free to while Megan is talking, ask questions, give ideas, tell Megan she said the craziest thing ever, whatever. Um, but feel free to use the chat um, throughout. So I think that's it for all I have. So Megan, I'm going to turn it over to you. Great, thank you so much, Linda. And thanks everybody for actually logging in and doing this live with me. It's so much more fun when we get to work together on these things. So like Linda said, I've got a ton to cover today, so I'm just gonna jump straight in. So first up, who the heck is this woman? Why is she talking to slash at us, especially on webinars? So first, uh, my current position is I'm the experience designer and coordinator for the Chattanooga Public Library, which is a fancy way of saying programming librarian. If you wanna go by my government term, maybe some of you know this, I am an L2. Um, I'm also the author of a book for programming that's all focused on tweens and teens. I'm the creator of something called The Healing Library, which you may wanna check out. And I was an intern with Doc One a year ago, who is half of the team that's um, guilty for creating design thinking for libraries with IDEO. And finally, it, just in case we have any social media mavens out there, if you're a Twitter peep, um, I am Bibli, we are Yalsa, and this particular series is, is um, hashtag Y-A-L-S-A-C-E. Okay, so a quick note, just for those of you that don't know, um, I read my slides, just in case anyone in the audience has any visual impairments, uh, just to be sure that everybody's getting the same information. Okay, so what we're gonna cover today is an overview of what learning experiences are. Then we're gonna get a little more specific and break it down into terms of informal versus formal learning experiences, what we mean by teens, volunteers, community partners, and others, and what the heck is the difference between plan, implement, and evaluate, and how do those things sort of run into one another. Then we're gonna focus a little bit more on the competencies within the competency of developing, practicing, and transforming. And mixed throughout, we're gonna have a couple of examples. We're gonna check in with you guys to make sure that everybody gets what we're talking about and probably to make you realize that a lot of what we're discussing today, you're already doing. And then finally, we'll have time for questions like Linda mentioned. So if I'm in the middle of a diatribe, uh, just pop your question into that chat box and Linda's gonna sort of harvest those for the end of the discussion when we'll have a formal time for answering questions. Okay. So the competencies, this is something that actually Linda was an integral part of creating. It came out late, late, late 2017. And as you can see there, it's called Teen Service Competencies for Library Staff. So that doesn't just mean teen services people. It means all staff, because we all wind up interacting with teens. This isn't to say that everybody's ready for this yet, but you being a champion for these competencies within your library is gonna be huge as far as uh, modeling these behaviors for others and hopefully inspiring other people to get excited by them as well. In total, there are 10 competencies, and today we're focusing on learning experiences, which is number four. So a quick distinction though, um, if you happen to read the article that I wrote for y'all's journal recently, it was about learning environments. However, we're talking about learning experiences, and while there is a bit of bleeding over between these two, they are distinctly different. So learning environments have to do with physical spaces. It's competency number three on the list. Today, again, is number four, so it directly follows it, but it's more about the activities and the experiences that you're designing for your patrons. All right, let's break this thing down. The official definition they give, I'm gonna try and scoot this little box down. Here we go. The official definition they give is learning experiences. Staff work with teens, volunteers, community partners, and others 
to plan, implement, and evaluate high quality, developmentally appropriate, formal and informal learning activities that support teens, need, uh, teens personal and academic interests. So what we're gonna do is break this down so it's more comfortable for you than a pair of hammer pants. Specifically, let's start with this part, formal and informal. So if we look at formal, there, there are a couple different things I'm gonna focus on today. The first is the goal. Why would you plan a formal activity? Why would you plan an informal activity? And so a formal activity may have certain goals that need to be achieved, whether that's something like risk management to do with physical risks, say you're working with wood burning equipment, or emotional risks if you're touching on a topic that has triggers for your team. And there may be other more specific niche things like the care of animals. Perhaps you have folks coming in to talk about do you want to be a vet? Here's what it's really like. Uh, second, there may be requirements for you to fulfill a certain certification, a certain number of hours of complete to achieve that certification, or there may be really specific topics you have to cover. For this, a good example is something like driver's ed. And then finally, there may be resource, resource management things that you have to address as well. So something like an activity that has really pricey materials and limits the number of participants, or that uh, our staff time is valuable also. If there's only a limited amount of time that the person teaching the class can commit to this, then they have to be um, cared for as well. On the flip side, if you're gonna have an informal program, some of the goals there might include community building, so creating purposeful collisions between multiple types of community members. It may be collaboration and getting people to work together. It may be a different type of just interaction between patrons and other patrons, or patrons and staff, and that's a little bit less formal than community building or collaboration. Fourth, uh, you may find that conversation needs to take place, and informal environments are a great way to get that going. There may be self-guided learning opportunities, and for this I'm thinking of something like pop-up programs or passive programming. Perhaps informal learning needs to take place where there isn't exactly a goal, but more of a subject that you're gonna dance around and let the, let the kids sort of come up with the goals themselves. Perhaps relationship building is the goal, and that could be, again, between you and your patrons or patrons and other patrons. Um, and behavior management is a, a great sort of goal as well. A lot of these informal programs are how you build positive relations with people, teens and specifically, um, and those relationships make it easier for you to have, well, a more formal relationship technically that's gonna lead to better behavior on everyone's part. Okay, now, the second and third thing we're gonna look at with formal and informal are, let's see, did I go too far? Oh, I may have gone too far, hold on. Nope, we did it. So a few examples and some characteristics of what formal and informal look like. So a few examples of formal programs are classroom settings, a classroom type experience. Webinars, today you're currently engaged in a formal learning example. Conferences and some conference sessions, internships, outreach classes, and volunteer programs. Those are all things that have specific goals that have time limitations, material limitations, and goals that are more in line with formal learning. Uh, characteristics of those programs include structured activities, structured time, uh, structured behavior guidelines, saving questions until the end, like this webinar today, and milestones that you hope to achieve within it. So for us, slide by slide, these are our milestones. On the flip side, your informal programs, a few examples there, like I mentioned, are passive programs. So leaving a make a Valentine for the troops walk-up station where kids come up, create a Valentine and leave it with you. It's something that they're doing on their own time, at their own pace and under their own guidance. Workshops where you get to do some more hands-on type of things and have some breakout time. Pomago, which if you're not familiar is hang out, mess around and geek out. And those are three levels of engagement that are typically unstructured and informal. And then outreach and tabling. Finally, if you're going to a Comic-Con and you're gonna have a reading booth and maybe a button making booth, very informal, very uh, loosey-goosey. Finally, I know I said this before as a formal example, but your volunteer programs can also have many, many informal opportunities for kids to hang out together, create together, and uh, generally wind up learning. Maybe tell them, maybe don't tell them. Characteristics of these programs are typically they're flexible both with their time and their materials. It's the kind of thing where you you'll say something at the beginning like feel free to interrupt me with questions. There will be milestones to achieve much like your formal but it's a lot uh, it's a lot more flexible and there's a lot more wiggle room to achieve those goals or perhaps maybe there are less milestones than a formal program. 
Typically, there's no set start or end time for things like your passive programs or your Hamago, um, as well as your outreach and tabling. And then finally, uh, I like to focus a lot on what I call come and go welcome. So you can show up whenever, it's drop-in friendly, and the flip side of that is you can also leave when you have to. Okay, so a couple specific examples. One formal program that I run for teens is called Etsy Success. It's actually a curriculum that they designed and asked me to teach. Uh, the goal is uh, that we have a requirement to fulfill. There's a curriculum they designed that we follow. And the other goal is community building, which is technically an informal goal of mine. Um, the characteristics of the program, it's a three hour workshop. Kids are expected that they'll start their Etsy shops, but not complete them. You actually need to have uh, an adult who's a guardian in that process. And this is a way for us to get around that and get them excited and the knowledge they need to keep going. Uh, also best practices of the, and troubleshooting are addressed in this curriculum. There are slides that people follow along with, although they also have a packet they can fill things out with. We fill out worksheets together and the breaks are built into this program. So there are specific times for bathroom and um, question breaks. Although I, I tend to go a little more informal with that with, with our teenagers and allow them to just get up and wander around if needed. An informal example is a program I run called Cookie Chess Pop-Ups. Pop uh, in that kids play me in a game of chess, pretty easy. Uh, we also do it with checkers if they can't quite play chess yet. The goals are community building between patrons and patrons and staff and patrons, conversation, again, between both types of those groups, relationship building, and tons of interaction time. So there's a lot of banter, there's a lot of teaching, and there's a lot of casual conversation that takes place. The characteristics of the program are that it takes roughly a half an hour, and tweens and teens play me in chess. If they win, they get a free book to keep, paperback from our, our prize stash of books, and if they lose, but they've played to completion, so it's not like, I give up, they get a free cookie or a granola bar or whatever sort of snack we have lying around. And finally, this is the kind of program that the, the amount of people we have working the floor dictates. So if it's just me, I can't play Chester with you right now, but if there's three of us working and everything seems to be under control, for sure, who do you wanna play chess with? Okay, so now we're gonna take a quick break and we're gonna see what you're currently doing. I don't know why this slide looks so crazy on this screen. Sorry, it says, let's see what you're doing. But Linda has a quiz that she is going to pop up to people. And I just want to mention as we get started in this quiz, I'll also be switching over to a screen where you can see the results of the, the Google form we're going to fill out. But it's basically, let, this isn't about being perfect. This is about response time. And there's a certain honesty when you're just responding to a question rather than thinking and answering. So we're going to take about one minute to fill this out together. And so Linda, you can feel Megan, free to I, touch in. Megan yeah. I screwed up. So I oh, thought we decided not to do the poll and you would show it on the screen. So oh. can you just show it on oh, the great. screen? Well, Sorry that. about that. No, it's okay. How about this? There's the link to the poll. Okay, cool. Great. Where, so folks, here, I'll put, can you put it in the chat? Yeah, definitely. Okay, sorry about that. That's my fault. It's all good. We, if you hadn't guessed, folks, Linda and I got kind of ambitious <laughs> with this. So, <laughs> so here's a link. Okay. And if everybody wants to hop in there, and like I said, um, answer the questions based on response. So you're, you're intaking the information and your gut reaction is to click those boxes. I'm going to show it. I have it. Oh. oh. Yeah, you need to. Oh no! <laughs> Here it is. Oh no! Why is this mistakes happening? is a really good thing. Just in all of this, yeah. <laughs> this is a really helpful thing to just realize that you take risks, you make mistakes. It's all about what the competencies are all about. So can you share? Okay. <laughs> I know I'm, I'm in the I'm in my share, and I don't see the whole thing about collaborators. Yes, exactly. Jenny. Owner specific people. So this is it. Yeah. Oh no. Why can't I do that? Let's see. All right. Well, I don't yeah. want to waste too much time on this. Let's do this instead, folks. I'm going to scroll. I'm going to click back on this and we're going to just say we're done with this. I want people to, within the chat box, respond to some of these things. So let's skip name of program cool. because that's more form appropriate. 
but let's take a look at these questions together and just go ahead and flood the chat box with the answers for the first one. And the way this is set up is that you can have more than one answer per question. So it was multiple choice. So which of the following formal goals, I want you to keep one program in mind for this, whether it's um, your American Girl doll fashion class where you're teaching pattern making to teens, or whether it's um, you know how to be an active citizen and prepare to vote. So get one program in mind and keep that program in mind as we answer these questions. So which of the following formal goals does your program need to ma manage? Go ahead and enter your answers in the chat box and I'll read them off for, for others. Physical risk, emotional risk, care of animals, just wanted to keep that, certification, hours to complete, topics to cover, pricing materials, or staff time. Good We're getting a lot, oh. of, a lot of stuff. It's interesting. It seems to be like a mix. Staff and pricing materials are definitely yeah. the most that I'm seeing. Yeah. And one person says and all I'd the be and certification. Yeah, and I think this is pretty normal because when, for all of our programs, staff time, certainly with the budgets we have and the price of things dictates a lot. I would be willing to bet if we dove deeper into niche things that weren't at the tip of your brain, this might change a little. Okay, so we're gonna move on to the next question quickly. Which of the following informal goals does your program need to manage? Same program, community building, collaboration, interaction between patron on patron, interactions between patron and staff, conversation, self-guided learning, informal learning, relationship building, or behavior management. And there is a space for other if you have something really wonky you want to share with the group and throw up all of our results, that's fine. <laughs> I'm fascinated by how many people are doing a bunch of them. Like, it's not, there's nothing wrong with that, but how they all, yeah. it's not just one thing. <laughs> yeah, and this is great because you'll find Things don't do go together. I'd be really surprised if you were checking off one box for each of these questions or no boxes. And this just goes to show us that you guys are, yeah, yeah a lot of everything. <laughs> it just goes to show you that there's a lot of things that you're thinking about when you're building your program. So good on you. All right, we're moving on to the next one. Does your program fit into one of these formal example categories? Yeah. Classrooms, webinars, plan. conferences, uh, internships? Outreach classes or volunteer programs? Ooh! Oh, I love all the volunteer programs. My people! Yes, 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 <laughs> I love you. We should all be running really well um, documented volunteer programs. So I'm so happy to see that. I would say our volunteer program here at the library is our most popular program. And it is a program. We consider it a professional development program. Brilliant. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, next question. Does your program fit into one of these informal example categories? Passive programming, workshop, homago, outreach slash tabling, or volunteer program? Again, I got it in there again. So tricky. Workshops, homago. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, love that. Passive workshops. Great. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. A lot of Hamago, that's great too. They need that. All right, next up. Does your program have any of these formal characteristics? Structured, save questions until the end, milestones to achieve. Interesting. Ooh, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is fabulous. I think guy. we think it's Somehow. interesting. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm so happy. You have no idea how happy this makes my inner data nerd, you guys. Okay, next one. Does your program have any of these informal characteristics? Flexible, interrupt me with questions, milestones to achieve, no set start or end time, and uh, come and go welcome. Oh, oh, wow, this is really cool. Structured and flexible, I love this. How are people typing so fast? This is awesome. <laughs> you guys, you know there's no right answers, but these yeah. are really good answers. <laughs> well, I love how everybody's the same yet different. Like you can tell, yeah. like there's different, there's components are the same, but yet the way I can, I can hear their brains going, they're all different. I know, I, know, I love that. 
Okay, so we're back to my crazy slide. And now, is there a blend to this? So are there patterns that you're seeing? So since you filled out these things and you, you're the ones who wound up checking all those boxes, I wanna know who won. Was your program formal or informal? And this one, there is a right and a wrong answer. If you had more formal answers, that's your program. And either are fine, because what you'll probably see is that you wind up with a blend of them. So a lot of informal so far. Go ahead and put it in the box and let's see what we've got here. Mm -hmm. This is fascinating because there were so many informal and then there were so many structured parts of these informal programs. Informal, I think, question mark? Good answer. So where this goes, I said there's no right or wrong answers, except for this question, but even that is sort of sneaky because it's up to you now to be a professional and you're going to wind up probably layering formal elements into your informal program and informal elements into your formal program. So some layerable formal examples are time parameters. You may have an informal volunteer program, for example, but the kids should really only be working on that coloring project for half an hour. So you set that up for them. You may be announcing goals at the beginning of an informal program, or there may be an explanation of rules that people need to follow to ensure that the informal program stays informal, as funny as that sounds. Um, and then there are layerable informal activities or examples that you could put into your formal program. So things like having open discussion time, um, having icebreakers at the beginning of a program, or having snack breaks where people just sort of get to accidentally hamago and not realize it are all great ways to build some informal experiences into your formal program. All right, next up. Let's talk about this sentence, this part of the sentence. Teens, volunteers, community partners, and others. Let's break it down, just like MC Hammer and that seemingly government looking woman. So the most important thing to understand about this part is why we do it. And so there are three kinds of benefits that the design thinking for libraries team, who are far more brilliant than I am, came up with. So internally for the library, what it does is creates more confidence, it uh, creates better project management processes, and stronger collaborative culture, as well as strategic decision making without maybe realizing you're doing it. Externally for your patrons, what that does is create greater patron engagement and ownership, I like to say, increased customer satisfaction on their part, new ways connect to connect with their community, the library is the vessel for that, and more library advocates and loyalists who, let's admit it, are gonna be voters soon, especially with all this focus on youth voting uh, registration at 18. What it does for both of us is create increased responsiveness to patron needs and prioritizing and evolving effective services for your library. So this all has to do with design thinking. So for those of you that aren't familiar with design thinking, uh, the, again, design thinking for libraries defines it as a creative approach or series of sets steps that will help you design meaningful solutions for your library. If you think about it as a Venn diagram, which they created for you on the right, design thinking solutions exist at the intersection of three factors, desirability, feasibility, and viability. In other words, when the solution is desirable, it's financially viable, and it's technologically feasible, innovation happens where these factors overlap. And what I like to point out is the viability and business side, that's your budget. The feasibility side and technical stuff, that's your staff time and your uh, personal capabilities with teaching whatever it is. And then that desirability, that human element, yes, we, I mean, we can read People Magazine and we can try and keep up with Us Weekly and we can try and follow along with some of the Instagram stuff that's out there, but it is moving so quickly that your teams are the experts in the human element and desirability. So allow them to do that you take over these two sections on the right to guide them and what you create is that innovation in the center. As far as when to involve your teams and your non-staff staff in these, it also sort of affects how we do it. And so there's an iteration process that we use here. Initially, when you're getting started, you're inspired by something. And this is a great time to ask your teens, whether it's a tab or just the kids who hang out with you, hey, what do you think of this idea? Then you move into the ideation process where you're creating what you think that's gonna look like. And you could ask kids, would you rather do this for 20 minutes or do you think 10 is better and we should move on to this? Let them have some input there. And finally, in your iteration process, this is where you test it out on them. So you built it together, you've got a little group hanging out, 
launch that as an example of the formal program you'll do sometime later, and that's going to lead you to getting to scale, which is when you've actually built the real program that you launch on the public. So as far as who the heck are these people, it's a bunch of different people. So your teens are both your users and your non-users. And as far as how we reach those non-users, that's tabling at Comic-Cons, it's visiting schools, it's all those outreach things that we do. Your volunteers could be your tab, which is your teen advisory board, or it could just be your everyday crowd. Now, in addition to that, I'd love to hear what you've got for volunteers. Uh, sorry, who you consider to be formal, informal, not real volunteers, but we both know they're real volunteers. So if you want to slap that in the chat box, go ahead. Moving on to your community partners, your schools are certainly your community partners, whether it's a high school or something like that. Your community centers also shouldn't be ignored. Any agencies serving the same de demographic, so in my case, it's stuff like the Creative Discovery Museum, our Youth and Family Development Centers, um, the aquarium that we have, and really anybody that has a really good teen volunteer program is somebody that you should look at as an example. Beyond that, what else do you have? Is there something completely specific? Um, go ahead and put it in the chat box as well. And then finally, others, that's the tricky one. I like to think of this as my parents who get a vote, but certainly not the final say. If you have somebody unique and specific you wanna share with the group that they should consider as an other, go ahead and slam that in the chat box as well. Okay, next up, high quality, developmentally appropriate. This is a pretty easy one, so we're gonna break this down pretty quickly. So don't forget, you're still the expert. Nobody's trying to take away from the, uh, the fact that you are the librarian. Uh, you have a role to play, but you know what? Your kids are also experts. Instead of looking at it them as, uh, instead of looking at, at it as them doing your job, quote unquote, you need to look at it like you're an expert consultant. So keep their ideas in mind, but your job is to help shape their ideas, to be a leader to them so that they understand the parameters in which we all have to work within your system or space or staffing, and you're also uh, responsible for informing them. What that looks like is your own personal toolkit. So for sure, there are great things that YALSA offers, such as the teen programming guidelines. I refer back to this all the time, especially if I have presentations to give. Um, the YALS journal, since you're here, you can subscribe to this, no problem, uh, and get up-to-date uh, up -date quarterly articles on timely topics. But then there's stuff beyond that, conference sessions, whether you're lucky enough to go to ALA next week and leave us all behind, or whether it's a local session, even you know, your county librarians who are getting together. Your own professional and quirky inspiration should not be overlooked. If you, like me, are passionate about wacky punk rock uh, cheater sewing, you should be bringing that to your teens and seeing who else is excited about it. And then finally, you have a lot of system knowledge to share that your kids don't know about, whether it's your budget, the parameters, whether that's rules you have to follow in regards to noise or food or spaces, um, and then how to bend the rules. This is a really great one to give to kids because they're given tons of rules to live within, and the moment you get to sort of, I didn't say break, but the moment you get to bend the rules and do something special for them, they feel you're invested in them. Okay, so a simple way to get started is an activity that I put in my book. I call it Hey Big Spender, and it's perfect for focus groups. Um, what I do is I roll out, say, five new programming ideas that I've built the budgets for, I have timelines in mind, and I have a launch date that's maybe a month away, month and a half away. What I do is I give every teen five fake dollars, and they get to vote with their dollars on what program they want to see run next after I've explained what they are. Whoever gets the most money is the program that we launch on that date that I already have reserved and my boss has already approved. So without realizing that you know, we've already done the work and we can do whatever we want, we're giving them the power to say, here's what's gonna happen next in my library. Beyond that, we allow them to spit out their own ideas of like, hey, you know what else would be great? And we have space to write them all down. Um, I like to have a fun reward that's a sort of activity. Uh, so for example, we have a bunch of video game systems at our library and I may buy a new game and the kids who are there doing the program get to be the first ones to try it out. Or maybe I buy a new nail polish and accoutrement and they get to have a nail pop-up program where they get first dibs on all those new rhinestones and gold tapes and such. Um, beyond that, food never hurts, we already know that. And anything that's special about your library that you can give away is a good one. At my last library where I worked in Maine, we would give away um, free coupons for the movies that cost a dollar to borrow. Uh, here at the library, uh, we'll do stuff where we do these events after hours. 
So the whole building is closed. It's only available to our team. No one else is here except for us. Or if you have a special guest that you can bring in to teach them something or do makeovers or just hang out, that's always cool as well. All right, next up, we're gonna talk about the plan, implement, and evaluation portion. The first two, the plan and implement, are basically covered here. If you're doing this with your kids, you're already doing better planning and implementation than many, many people are. So we're gonna focus a little bit more on the evaluation piece. And this can look like a few different things, and it's gonna be different for all of our libraries. First, though, we focus on the quantitative piece. So that could be, yes, the number of people who attend your program. But if, like me, when you host a specific program, and so the after hours focus groups, for example, sometimes we have parents who come to that, and our door counters can show us spikes in addition to the program attendance that wouldn't have happened if it weren't for that program taking place. That can be interesting information, especially if you wind up seeing a spike in circulation for a specific type of material or focus of material. Surveys are for sure great if you can get people to fill them out. And that could be paper, it could be online, it could be uh, through oral, um, really whatever works for you. Another nice version of a survey is just comment cards. So here at our library, we take all of our comment cards very seriously. I just got programming recommendations from patrons today that had to do with, um, you need to teach sewing on Saturdays and we want French lessons. And so we've already started bantering around, how do we actually do this? and who's gonna be involved in that process. Then you need to look at the qualitative and like anything else, there's the good and the bad, and of course the ugly when it comes to our qualitative stuff that we're getting. So the good, patron collision. You might see things like co-teaching and co-learning taking place, which are so beautiful to witness. You may pay more attention to your patron body language, things like smiles and laughter, comfortable positions, no crossed arms, um, and then the comments that you're hearing would be happy, would be in line with what you're trying to teach, would be excited. The bad side of this, your patron's collisions may wind up resulting in things like patrons being rude to one another or bullying taking place. Paying attention to that is important so that you know how to reshape your program or that this program needs to be left behind. You may notice body language like frowns or eye rolling beyond typical teenage snark um, that gets into damaging, damaging stuff. Uh, and then as far as your comments, you would hear negative comments, you would hear, um, a lot of times you'll hear from kids that have to be there for something, how stupid it is, how they don't wanna be there, but those are all negative comments. That's a bad review of the program. Um, and then finally, the ugly, which we never wanna think about, but patron collisions would look like maybe fights breaking out. Patron body language would maybe look like them setting fire to your stack. And perhaps you would hear hate speech for your comments instead of anything positive or negative, so beyond that. Now, that's, it's a little bit of levity, but for sure, these are things to keep in mind and not just skirt over and say, wow, that was bad, let's not do that again. Maybe actually evaluate that and write it down somewhere. Keep it for later. You never know when it'll be helpful. Beyond the quantitative and the qualitative, this is about learning experiences, so we wanna think about the kind of experiences that we're creating for people. Are you offering a variety of learning experiences that will suit the many types of learners that are out there? We know about the seven learning types, visual, logical, verbal, physical, oral, social, and solitary. If you're doing a sewing class, do you offer a solitary and a social version? Do you offer written instructions for the people that are visual learners, as well as standing up in front of them doing the verbal and then allowing them to participate in the actual sewing and getting that physical? Um, I'm sorry, I meant oral before. Are they able to teach one another and participate in verbal learning? And do you offer opportunities for experimentation so that their logic can come into play as well? It's just one example. As far as how we harness all of this, because it is a ton of information, we wanna be sure we're involving our teams, whether we're asking for their opinions, asking for their direct feedback, or whether we're sharing that feedback with them to say, here's why this was a success. Look at what we created making them understand what success looks like. You may keep it in a spreadsheet. You might report it out in your monthly stats. If it's just observations and those warm and fluffies, make sure you're reporting it out somewhere, whether it's in a written report, whether you're telling your boss what's happened, whether you're communicating that to your board or your um, funding sources. You may be giving presentations like today. You may be talking about it in grant applications and also in grant reports, so any of that language and you may have other self-assessment tools that you've designed in-house or personally for yourself where you're keeping track of these things. So now, 
I'm going to take a drink of water and we are going to talk about upping your game. I'm willing to bet that everybody here has already been participating in the sort of um, micro competencies that are listed within this learning experience competency. So there are three levels that every competency in this guide is broken into. The first is developing, the second is practicing, and the third is transforming. So developing is considered the minimal skills and knowledge needed by library staff who are getting started learning about and or implementing the competencies in their work for or with team. Practicing is the basic understanding and knowledge needed by library staff to apply or integrate the competencies into their own practice. And third is transforming, which is the advanced knowledge and skills needed by library staff to apply the competencies in nuanced ways to engage in evaluation and to change mindsets about the ways team services should be implemented inside and outside the library. And what I love about this is it's not just a linear path. Developing is anytime you're trying something new out. Practicing is your day-to-day -day work that you need to be communicating with others, whether it's coworkers, other departments, funding sources, government, beyond. And transforming are goals that you can aim for professionally, both internally and externally, either as the lead or the contributor to. So that could be writing, writing articles, writing blog posts, writing web content for your own web page or for sources beyond. Attending conferences, especially if you're going to be a panelist, a poster present, uh, presenter, or a speaker, and then giving presentations to your board, to your funding committee, to government, to partner organizations. So let's see how you're doing. I'm going to bring this chat up again, and I'm going to read each of the micro competencies. And what I want is, I don't know, think you can do thumbs up in here, but if you want to say like, yes, or me, or woot, or me too, just pop into the chat box every time I read one that you're already engaging in. So for developing, understands how teams learn, explore career options, and develop life skills through relationships, coaching, mentoring, and interest-driven activities. Yes, I knew it. All right. And there is a raise hand button. Just so you know, there's oh, also there's a, a button. There's a raise hand button. So you can raise hands too. <laughs> understands the connected learning framework and that all teams learn and develop through active participation and choice. Mm -hmm. I see you. Oh, I love the plus sign. Good on you. Recognizes that teams, uh, recognizes that change, stress, and transition affect teen social emotional development, behavior, and engagement. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> recognizes the importance of developing and following a plan of action to facilitate and implement year-round learning across all aspects of service, from collections to programs to community engagement. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yay, Carter. <laughs> recognizes the values of assessment and assists in evaluating the effectiveness of learning experiences. Yeah, uh-huh, <laughs> yippers. <laughs> identifies and obtains resources necessary to support year-round teen learning. Yeah, oh, look at them roll in. You guys are awesome. All right, we're going to move on to practicing, which I'm willing to bet we're going to hear a lot of yeses for as well. Encourages teens to be inquisitive and try new activities and opportunities. Uh-huh. <laughs> uses a broad collection of effective teaching strategies, tools, and accommodations to meet individual teen needs, build on cultural strengths, address learning differences, and enhance learning. <laughs> awesome. Builds activities and interactions year-round that promote critical thinking, problem solving, intellectual openness, and multiple literacies. Oh, I love, yeah, you know what, Josh, trying is great. Encourages teens to participate in the design and implementation of formal and informal learning activities throughout the year. Brilliant. Yes, yeah, me too, Emily. <laughs> All right, build learning outcomes into the design and implementation of learning activities. 
Oh, it is hard, Cheryl. But the fact that you're trying means you're already, you're on your way. Good, sneaky like yes. Good, Laurel. <laughs> All right, let's move on to transforming. Connect the library to community resources that support teen learning experiences. Good. Yes, Amy, building it counts. Yes. Laurel, building counts. Yes, yes, yes. Brilliant. All right, collaborates with other organizations, groups, and agencies to maximize year-round learning opportunities for and with teens. Good. Reflects on effectiveness of learning activities to support team needs, interests, development, culture, learning styles, and abilities, and makes appropriate changes. Yeah, this is really any of us that sort of reflect on our job and how we're doing and how it went. Even if you don't have a formal process for recording those changes that you're making or how those activities are taking place and affecting those things, I'm willing to bet everybody here is doing it. Assists in strategic planning and goal setting for the improvement of year-round learning activities. Oh my God, yes, it is constant work. You're right. Okay, connect current theories, research, resources, best practices, and policies related to the design and implementation of year-round learning experiences. Oh, yay, thanks, Gabrielle. <laughs> and Lisa, yeah, exactly. You're here, you're doing it. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, good. Coaches and mentors others in the development of library policies related to the design and implementation of year-round learning experiences. Oh, I love to see people say yes to this one. Great. Wonderful. <clears throat> That's even just standing up for your department people. <laughs> okay advocates for and seeks out essential resources to support year-round teen learning. I bet you do this too. Oh, the powers that be for sure. But that's part of coming to this today and recognizing, so these strategies are also things that you can utilize when communicating these, these things that you're doing effectively with other staff, staff members or your administration. Absolutely. Oh, I love seeing all these. Okay. So when we put all of this together, that all of this evaluation stuff, consider this. What if you were to create a specific self-evaluation tool where you were able to assess your programs in terms of your informal and formal, whether that's your goals, examples and characteristics, your developing, practicing and transforming competencies, and your quantitative and qualitative feedback. Imagine the impact that you could create for people in that sense. When we're taking so many warm and fuzzies and turning them into cold, hard numbers that speak a language for you. And really, I mean, any combination of this, whatever works for you or you need to focus on could be included in this. You don't need to blow anyone's minds yet, and I don't mean to blow yours, but maybe you do. Like Maybe we can all do a better job for our kids by accurately representing this hard work that we're doing, utilizing this competency as a framework. So if you want to learn more about this, or you're just feeling like unstoppable right now, and you can conquer the world, you can. And there are more ways to get involved in this on, on deeper levels. So first up is that we're going to have a Twitter chat Thursday, June 28th at 7 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, and the link is there. Second, check out those team competencies for library staff, because it's something so powerful that you can tie your hard work back to. Next up, if you were interested or inspired by the design thinking process of the, uh, what we discussed today, that book is for free and you can download it at the website that I've provided, as well as some smaller versions of like dip in activities if you wanna try running them with staff or your team. And then finally, consider taking a peek at Yelsa's professional tools also. So all those links are provided to you. And thank you so much for sticking with me as your reward. You get this adorable photo of my dog Dibley, who yes, was named after the BBC show, The Vicar of Dibley. Um, he's adorable. And so that is your warm and fuzzy for sticking it out with me. So I would love to know now what kind of questions came up. Oh, and yes, he is so good. He's a very good boy. <laughs> if you don't watch, I'll, I'll 
put up a picture of my dog and we'll have to fight over whose dog is cute. Mm. And what kind or of dog experience is that? <laughs> <laughs> so do people have questions for Megan? I have a couple, but I'd love to hear. And feel free to unmute yourself. Um, use your video if you would like. Questions? Comments? Yeah, to go. Oh, and to start off, Sherry, yes, he's a Border Collie Australian Shepherd mix, we think. Although I suspect from that dome you can see there that he might have a little pit in him too. Oh my God, so true. He's my first dog also, so I'm a little impartial, but um, yeah. <laughs> okay, what else? Oh, great. <laughs> so the question from Jacqueline is, how do we advocate for our teens when our staff is teen? Oh, sorry, I'm going to let Linda catch that. <laughs> and then you can read them, Linda. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, okay, so... Well, I actually had, um, okay, go ahead. So if you, um, am I, no, okay. Um, how do you advocate with staff who are resistant and when you get a ton of teens, how do you, uh, middle schoolers in particular, who are challenging because they're awesome, um, how do you help? <laughs> Um, they are. I mean, that is part of why they're awesome. Yeah. Um, so how do you advocate for uh, your middle schoolers or middle schoolers or younger teens when they're a little bit rambunctious? And then also, how do you turn into um, the learning experience they can have? How do you make that positive when you're dealing with the influx, the staffing concerns, and the teens themselves? Does that make sense? Yeah, so it sounds sort of like three things. So the first one was how do you advocate with staff, especially when they're rambunctious and whether or not they're tweens or rambunctious or just in the space of adults who don't normally work with tweens and right. teens, although we all do. Like I think part of it at first is breaking that barrier of that's your department. They're all our patrons. So that's first of all something I like to communicate with people. Second, this quantitative manipulation of the qualitative things that we're doing is a really, really powerful tool. Um, so any opportunity, any staff day that comes up where they're like, we're looking for presentations or sending something into the board of directors so that it's in their notes and it's documented and people are paying attention, any opportunity like that where you can share your statistics and your stories is going to have an impact. We need to use our voices to stand up for our kids. Um, second, I loved the part about we have these rambunctious tweens and it's crazy. How do we get them involved? Like harnessing that beast can be daunting, but that's where things like Hamago and the informal programming structures are beautiful. So having pop-up programs, as we call them here in Chattanooga, which are resources that are a little more expensive, but we can stretch. So like the nail art supplies, um, perler beads that require an iron. So that's a little dangerous. We don't just leave it out on the floor. Um, our robots like Dash and Dot and Ollie, those are all things that we let our tweens know are available to them. And then when we've lent it out to them, guess what? There are some informal rules that take place. So it might be telling them, you're responsible for this. So when you're all done, even if she wants to use it, I need you to bring it back to me so I know who's got it. And then you wind up learning their names, you wind up checking in on them. You may also have rules like, don't hit anyone with the robot. And so you're layering that formal stuff into place before they even realize it. They just think they're getting to play with the robot. Once that happens, you use those opportunities to start building your relationships and asking them, what should we buy next? I can't decide if we're going to go with this thing or if we're going to go with this thing. What would you buy? And then you're starting with that informal version of the planning, the iteration process, and you've got them. So don't, you don't have to think of it as building the formal stuff immediately. And I saw this as well with the, how do you, we just need to get teens in here and we don't have a lot of space and there's no teen department. Um, open up after hours and make the entire library the teen department, offer some of these informal things. And then before you know it, you're utilizing them to build more formal opportunities that are giving them ownership, that are investing them in your space and in your relationship and in your offerings. And then you know what? They're teenagers and then they're adults who are voting. That's a great question. So actually, you make that with us? I'm going to push back on something you said, because I can, I know, I know really, yeah. and I don't like that word pushback. For some reason, I don't like it. But anyway, I'm going to push back a little bit, and it goes to a couple of other questions that have come up here, is I have a really hard time 
with, and some people who are in this session know this, the thing about getting them in the library, like that shouldn't be the first thing we're thinking about in my mind and in thinking about the community and somebody asked about how do we um, reach out to community members. It's like, mm -hmm. if we, if we're thinking about, oh, we have to get them in the library, you're not thinking about building the relationship first, right? Mm. You're thinking about your right. building and your space. And yes, you can do awesome stuff there for, with them, but don't you have to think about how do we build a relationship so that we're doing awesome stuff, learning and engaging learning with the teens, no matter where they are? What do you say to that? Absolutely. And that's part of, that's part of when we talked about engaging with teens who are, I, I mentioned users and non-users. Yeah. Yep. Your non-users can sometimes have the most impactful things to offer you, and they're not in your building. So you need to do effective outreach, like going to the Comic Cons, going to the schools, going to skate parks, showing up at events where teens and tweens don't have anything going on, and being that one little oasis where they're taken care of, that's going to start building your relationships. And so the button maker is a really good example. Um, we will bring the button maker out to a ton of different activities. And while they're there, while we're there and they're there, we'll say, yeah, this is set up all the time on the second floor. You don't even have to have a library card to use it. You can just swing by whenever and make a bunch of buttons. And sure enough, they wind up showing up. And again, that's getting them into the physical space, which isn't the most important thing. The most important thing is the relationship you build with them. But you know what? Your outreach generates statistics as well. That's a great point, Linda. Great. Thank you. I'm sorry. It's just, I hear so many times people say they don't come into the building, but no, and why is that? So <laughs> thank you for letting yeah. me do that. Um, let's see. So here's another question. There's a question about um, 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 community members. How do if, how what is the most effective way to reach out to community members? Um, the pe reaching out, the people don't respond quickly. They don't respond. Mm -hmm. Don't want to go over someone's head. So what do you think about making those kinds of connections? I. Wow, that's a really tricky question because it sort of depends on who you're talking about. The way I would approach a shelter for women and children is completely different than the way I would approach um, a recreation department about in intern opportunities at their summer program. Mm -hmm. um, I think you need to sort of have your end goal in mind. And I never let that whole like, oh, I don't want to go any above, it, above anybody's head thing stop me. I always say, awesome. Well, I'd love for you to be involved in the conversation. Who should we talk to next at your organization? Um, it, yeah, it's sort of a, a hard question. Um, if they wanted to ask a follow, like give me some follow-up information, maybe, maybe that would help. But I think having your end goal in mind is important. Um, I love anything tactile and anytime I'm able to bring an opportunity to another organization that's going to sort of wow their people and it's something that not everybody else can do, that's a positive. And I'll just say that, remember, um, that you could go as a learning experience as opposed to a telling experience. So you could say, set up a meeting mm -hmm. with a community member and just say, hey, I wanna hear what your day is like. And then bring the coffee or whatever else. If you're gonna go, bring them something that shows you re you're respectful of their time. I would take coffee, other people would want other things probably. Um, so there's another question about, um, high school students and getting them involved particularly when their parents are like no this isn't worth it you should you know your academics are most important and you shouldn't be doing something fun at the oh. library what thoughts do you have about yeah that? oh that's such an easy one you're gonna love this whoever asked that. <laughs> <laughs> so coming to a focus group for example is volunteering they're little consultants if you can set up again like a cocoa a cocoa bar and have just a conversation informally with a group of teens that's volunteering time and that is great for college applications if they're building relationships with me i will write them letters of recommendation that are so much more thorough than the typical experience because what they're offering the library is much more than stuffing an envelope answering a phone pointing someone towards the bathroom what they're doing for us is high level volunteering and we will actually translate their service into a financial number. There's actually something called Independent Sector that has a brilliant website you can go to where it translates volunteer time into a dollar amount, both on a national scale and state by state. So you can see right now, I know that I know the, the, the national average is like $26 an hour. So you can actually provide those parents with a dollar amount in-kind donation 
that their child gave to the library for their volunteer service throughout the course of their entire experience volunteering with you. And that is so great for college. So here's a really interesting, um, qu they're not all interesting, but one in that has a little discussion <laughs> going. Um, oh, and the Volunteers for Dollars. Can you say that website again? Oh yeah, Independent Sector. And if you just Google um, value of volunteer time or value of volunteer hour, it's always like the first or second Google result that pops up. So there's this question about introverted staff and having conversations with teens. And it's getting started. It's building that relationship. It's talking about thing, uh, things more than books. Like, so how do you yeah. have a conversation with teens, particularly when you're not very comfortable? So I, again, I know I'm sort of like a programming based person, and this is going to be another programming answer, but that's sort of why you tuned tune in. So I don't feel terrible about this. But that's where your quirky expertise really comes into play. Um, I've seen relatively shy or introverted staff members in the past who we could set up at a table with a particular type of activity. And if they're really engaged in what they're doing and maybe pop on a little bit of music, teens will walk up to them or tweens and say, what are you doing? And, and then it's a one-on-one, -on -one, right? Or maybe it's a small group of friends, but you're already put, putting that person in a position where they're in a comfortable zone for themselves and people are asking questions about something they're interested in and so that can be a really nice way to sort of break the ice and start building that relationship and from there it is hard if you're introverted because it's, it's conversation based and it's relationship building but it's also part of our job and I think it's um, you would never believe this but I was an introvert when I was younger and uh, I, I learned how to break that basically and I, I realized years later I was just like anxious about being nerdy and it wasn't really being introverted but I found so many people really value my quirky personality and the little things that I love other people love too and so it wound up being a lot easier to talk to people about things. That's great thank you. So here's one and actually there's some interesting responses already and it's, I think this is going to be our last um, question because we're <laughs> running out of time but there's a question about teens who are coming in and gambling and get thrown out. So, Ooh. right, so the, so how do you channel that, that, in, I mean, they're there for a reason, right? Not just for gambling, probably, but they're there for a reason. <laughs> how do you, uh, how do you channel that? And I think it's interesting that um, Mackenzie said, if they're money motivated, you might try business building programs, but what other ideas might oh. you have? I love Mackenzie's answer, and I completely agree with her. It's tricky, right? Because they aren't allowed to break the law when they're in our building. So how do you twist that and turn it, on, turn it on its head? And even if it's saying something like, guys, we can't do that. And I hate to be the one to, to break down your money-making schemes here, but um, we, we have a lot of, our, our current staff that we have in our team department is super into board games. And so maybe there's a way to shift it in that direction and say, we can't do this for money, but if you're into this kind of thing, I think I know something you'd enjoy. And maybe they run away and they don't come back. Or maybe they say, well, what is it? You know what I mean? So I don't know. We all, we all recognize that our teens and some of our tweens can smell a phony from the very get-go. So you have to find a way that you're, and I, don't, I hate this phrase of like speaking your truth, but you have to find a way that you're earnestly being yourself and trying to re-engage them so that it doesn't smell phony or they're just going to hate that. But I love, Mackenzie, I love the idea of like other ways to make money. I came to this realization probably uh, three or four years ago that what teens really want from me is they want freedom, which is stuff like driver's licenses and bus passes and understanding how to um, navigate in the world. They want really unique experiences and they want money. And so like the Etsy program is a great way for us to talk about all right, so you haven't been hired by somebody yet, but let's talk about what effective branding is for yourself. Let's talk about how your skill set should be earning you money and has value because they do have value. And that, that extends beyond just, you know, financial value, but we get into that and it's really kind of fun. Um, so there are ways to twist things and I love turning it into a money-making program. Have a job fair, have an internship fair. Have somebody come in and talk market. about side hustle. Right, play the stock market. That's Play the right. stock market, yeah. Right? I mean, there's a, a thing yeah. that's interesting to me about that is there's so much math in that. There are so many things that you could pull out of that that could be a great informal mm -hmm. learning experience. It's just finding out what it is that will make that connection. 
I love the Etsy idea. Yeah, oh my God. And Bitcoin, Disney oh, that's Bitcoin. brilliant, Desi. Bitcoin, yes. Bitcoin, because there is so <laughs> much there about Bitcoin. Oh my gosh. Yeah. You thought about and that. And I've been thinking a lot lately about how valuable it would be. Like, I, my library is located in a very urban location in close to some non-desirable neighborhoods, and I've been thinking about how powerful it would be for those kids to learn about the retirement process at age 12, 13, 14, and to begin saving 25% of what they get from mowing lawns. I know this woman whose father made her do that in like the, what, she's about 10 years older than me. So in the 80s, she had to start every time she babysat somebody, her dad made her put 50% away. And at first she was like, my dad said, yeah, and I could have more pizza and I could afford a car if I blah, blah, blah. And now she has this ridiculous nest egg that I will probably never have. <laughs> and like kids could do that. But you could have financial investors come in and talk to them about that. And those kids would probably freak out. Like, I could retire. That's what we all want. <laughs> Give it to them. <laughs> That's great. Um, we are out of time and people are starting to leave. So I'm going to say thank you so much, Megan. That was awesome. I really appreciate it. And thank you for going with the flow um, when the polling didn't work. <laughs> I think it was okay anyway, um, but thank you. Thank you everyone for being here. I will send out an email tomorrow morning probably with links to evaluation, slides, um, video recording, chat, and anything else that comes to mind. There will be a follow-up Twitter chat on the 28th at um, two, uh, 7 p.m. Eastern. You also see E is the hashtag. Um, and thank you. If you have any questions, you know where to find Megan and me. Thanks, Megan. Bye, everybody. Thanks, guys. See you later. <laughs> <laughs>